Welcome back to The Deal Room and part two of our mini series on Ask Me Anything, which is a Q&A from our student community of analysts on our summer program. So in part one, we talked about lots of things from if I didn't do a spring week, am I doomed? The timeline of career progression within the investment banking department and lots of other good stuff. So go back, listen to that if you haven't already done so. There's no real set order to listen to this mini series. In this one, though, we're going to tackle a whole brand new series of five questions, which will kind of divvy up between myself and Stephen. So let's get straight into it. And a shout out to Hector Thornacroft, who came out with the first one for you, Stephen. Hector asked, what is the difference from a technical and cultural perspective of working in the UK versus the US? Thank you so much for that. And then H Hector, what a brilliant name. Hector Thornycroft. I'm going to look out for that name. 20 years time, I reckon. Pretty senior, bit of a big wig, I reckon. But anyway, thank you for the question. So yeah, the difference between uh, working in the UK and the US. So I've had experience working in Canary Wharf um, for HSBC and then moving over and doing the same thing in the US. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can take this. The first is from a generic work perspective, there is a percentage increase in the intensity and the expectation in the US. Everything from you don't get as much holiday, you know, 15 days a year is pretty standard, 20 days probably. In the UK, you're hoping for 25. It's it's longer working hours. I'd say you're probably in a probably more competitive environment because the industry is flooded with MBAs and incredibly technically smart people. So I definitely say it ramps up. In New York, it's it's a more <laughs> it's a more fast paced culture in general. You're busy every evening. You're busy every day. Interesting enough, just as an aside, they drink a lot less from a social perspective in the US relative to the UK. So again, this has changed a little bit in the last ten or fifteen years. But in the UK, quite a lot of the relationship building would be over a lunch, and over a lunch you'd probably have a drink. You wouldn't have a hundred drinks, but you might have one or two. Whereas in the US, I think I made the mistake when we had our first client lunch and I ordered a ordered a drink and everyone else went soft drink. And I thought, oh gosh, maybe I've got this a little bit wrong. So there's a slightly more, uh, slightly less relationship, slightly more hard edged environment. The second thing that I want to say is it depends what bank you're working for, right? So HSBC was one of the big dogs in Canary Wharf. And it was a great place to work because we were the first phone call that most organizations made when they were looking to borrow money or, or do something interesting. Whereas in the US, working for HSBC, you're probably the last phone call. <laughs> so from a work environment, it was lovely to be in the UK, not so good to be in the US. And just have a think about that from a career perspective. Join the bank in the department that is flying in the geography that you want to work and then you get access to the best deal flow and things like that and do you have any experience I don't know, have you ever worked in the us no 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 i haven't so but yeah i've definitely had clients in the us that i've interacted with a lot both in current and old job and yeah perhaps a little bit different in terms of the when i would get to meet them often would be in the social context so they'd come to london I'd have to go out to entertain, essentially. Yeah, and there's a little bit, you're right, there is definitely a difference in the, yeah, what I was going to ask you was the same as then. So in terms of improving the value of your stock within an organization, um, I'm assuming then it's building those bonds at the pub after work often where you can make a lot of that, build that capital. But in the US then, is it just how good you are, essentially? Yeah, I think one, one of the questions that didn't quite make it into our list was, look, I don't drink, but mm. a lot of my colleagues do. And is that to what extent is that a problem? And <laughs> happily, today is much better than it was 10 years ago. And I'm sure it will be better again in 10 years time in terms of the acceptance of different lifestyles and things like that. My, <laughs> my advice or my bottom line is if you are good enough, your talent will win out and your resilience and determination will win out. 
yes, you might feel like you're missing out a little bit by not going out and doing doing the social drinking. I still encourage you to go and be sociable. Um, but by the way, just remember, if you're the one that's not drinking, just remember there's always someone that's drunk too much and they're probably making a bit of a fool of themselves. So maybe you're playing a little bit of an ace hand with regards to that element. But yeah, I, you know, you know, someone asked me, you know, do you still need to play golf? No. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're part of an organization that is a little bit, you know, old school and you don't feel like you fit that culture, well, it's a good opportunity to think about what culture would fit you. So, you know, there are different cultures and different banks and different organizations, and you'll feel the sense maybe during an internship or during a work experience that that culture is the one for you. I think one thing I might add there is that not geographic difference, but when I first started my career in 2006, our predominant interaction would have been with proprietary traders from prop shops. Mm. This is pre-financial crisis. And this was kind of the kind of classic barrow boys were very common. And they definitely liked um, to burn a candle at both ends. And one of the things I think that I was um, kind of well brought into that community, even though I only did about 5% of, let's say, the extracurricular activities that were happening, the difference was I was always there. Mm. And I did a good job in the office. I helped in the process. It's the analyst and they're the trader of helping them make money. And then I was there present then in the evenings um and there was also there was always a lot of like built up then trust that helped then the fluidity of that relationship in the office environment and, and i wasn't necessarily doing like i say even half the stuff that they were doing <laughs> you just so you don't need to is the point but you but i feel like you do have to be part of that to be like in any tribe if you just sat over there and you're not doing anything well then it's going to be hard for people to really bring you in and trust you so there's a degree of just getting involved, I would say. So yeah, I guess I guess a, a follow up question. We'll, we'll we'll jump around a little bit here, but to what extent, to what extent do you think that office politics are important to progression within an uh, within a firm, especially a a relatively kind of hierarchical firm? Do you have to play the game? Yeah, I mean, we could probably talk about this from different perspectives because I've always generally worked in fairly small outfits where it's much more flat i would say however with that comes with um there isn't a hr and all those other wonder weird and wonderful departments to sort of go to and speak to you have to deal with a lot of that stuff up front yourself if you're going to manage it i think that's a big difference so being able to get used to confrontation kind of management if you like and being okay with that as a young person it's so difficult like to stand there and hold your ground or speak up or know when the line has been crossed and things like that and not have a kind of external third party to confine in. So, yeah, I think there definitely is politics to a certain degree. I think you have to be sensible. I think there was still even at that level a degree of optics. I think senior people still do expect you to be there Um at a certain time mm. to have a certain length of lunch break to basically, I think a lot of the senior people for my experience set the behavioral norms. And if they're doing it, then they expect as a baseline minimum that the junior people to them are doing at least the same. Um, so that's, yeah. that was been my experience of it. Yeah. I think I'd add to that. I think, you know, office politics. Yes. Every organization has office politics, the most important thing is whether you're good or not. So you, your progression in the firm will be determined by just how good you are. If you and actually, if you're trying to, you know, brown nose your boss or whatever it might be, it might actually fly back in your face. Get your head down, do really good work, be present, play the game. You know, you might have to you know, show up at the right time and leave at the right time, but that's just what's expected of you as a junior. Beyond that, trying to play politics as a junior, it's probably more likely to get you burnt. Just, just be good. That's, <laughs> mm. that's the, uh, that's the best advice I can give. I guess, I guess one thing that I definitely got to learn through my early career was being able to not like someone but have a perfectly good relationship with them. Mm. I don't need to invest overly my energy into them. I don't need to give too much time to that 
that uh, relationship, but it needs to be managed in a way where you don't know when your paths might cross or they might be a decision maker in a process. It's understanding how to manage people that you have natural frictions with and flourish with people that you naturally are drawn to. I think mm. that's a skill that it's hard. You, you have to learn that through early career life experience, I think. Yeah. Don't have enemies. Don't have yeah. enemies. That's that's <laughs> the absolute key, uh, especially in, in, well, throughout your whole career, actually. What about this next one? Um, what attributes would you want junior analysts to have? Mm. Paint the yeah. picture of the perfect junior. <laughs> um, okay. So for me, and I can only speak of myself. So you, other hiring people will have different perspectives. For me, when I'm when we're talking about, let's say, grad level or students at university level, to me, it is 100% about attitude. Because at this point, there's generally been a process which is vetted for general basic things like academics and so forth. So they've kind of cleared the necessary or jumped through necessary hoops. For me, then, it just comes down to hunger, desire, motivation. I honestly believe apart from maybe a 10% of the jobs that exist in financial services, maybe less, maybe 5% that anyone can learn these jobs. I don't think they're, I think they're artificially kind of barriered or probably for good reason by the people that sit in the powers that be to keep it a certain way. But I honestly think anyone can learn a lot of these roles the difference between those who can do it and have success and those who can't and fail purely comes down to attitudes in my opinion so that's number one so when i look out for someone on the desk what is their energy their demeanor how do they operate with others how do they receive feedback how do they act on constructive criticism um, how do they bounce back when something's gone badly and a lot of that is totally non-technical all of it is <laughs> because at the beginning why should you have super deep technical knowledge you've not had any application of it in the real world yet so that's my best judgment then of your future potential i would say yeah i really like that i mean attitude is so important i was just thinking about the times when i've had a direct report and they've just been absolutely brilliant and it's just the the most wonderful thing when you have a junior that's just fantastic. And the three things that come to mind, the three criteria that come to my mind uh, for the perfect analyst, the first is they've got to predict things before you even ask for it. So if I say, hey, can you get me that report? And they say, I did it this morning. I've already done it. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. You can't beat that. So they need to kind of get into your mind and go, all right, what does Stephen want today? I'm going to do it before he even asks. That's number one. Number two, you need to have high enough quality work so that after four or five times that I check your work, I trust you. There are no errors in the first four or five times. So that is going to save so, so much time, me thinking that I have to check every single part of your work. So really, really smash it with regards to attention to detail at the beginning. And then thirdly, showing initiative. The last thing that I want is someone that's spamming me a hundred times a day, asking things that I can, you know, that they can probably figure out themselves. So if you have those three attributes, you're just going to make the most, you know, if you make your seniors life easy and better and more enjoyable, A, they're going to like you. B, they're going to invest more in you because you freed up time. You freed up some of their time and they're going to want to invest that back into you. So yeah, those are my three. Gosh, you'll yeah. be a great analyst if you do those. <laughs> yeah, and, and and also not belittling what you can and how you can add value. Like you do so much work with the Microsoft Activision, let's say modeling. It's like, okay, you might be a gamer and you know infinitely more about the gaming suite of Activision. Well, then share that because actually you've got great intel and you might go onto Reddit feeds and things like that that you could present to a desk, for example, and go, oh, have you seen this? They're talking about that and they're connecting it to this. And it's like, again, you know, just because it's not traditional doesn't mean it's not valuable. All right, so back to you then. We had Sam Hoffmans from the Summer Group and Sam asked, what are common misconceptions 
about investment banks that you wish more students understood? Ooh, good question, Sam. I'm going to keep this brief. I'm going to do two, uh, two common misconceptions. The first is that you work 16 hours a day intensively every single day. So we've just got off the back of, of the summer analyst training program, the second cohort, and they do a 24 hour m a sprint challenge. And that is really, really intense. They have to put together a financial model and a, a full pitch deck, and they often work very late and very intensively. Now that is quite representative of some days in the office, but Although you're expected to be at the office for quite a long time, the cadence of your day is not always mega, mega intensive. So you might, you know, get in at 9.30 and you've got some things to do, got some things to update, some emails to send. And then maybe you send a pitch deck, a draft pitch deck to a director and you're waiting on feedback. So you get a bit of downtime. Maybe you go to the gym. Maybe you grab dinner with your fellow analysts and then you've got some, you know, some markups to do from nine till 11 p.m. Yes, the days are long, but you're not you're not glued to your screen for 15, 16 hours every single day. So it's maybe slightly less intensive than people might imagine. It's not, you know, sometimes it is very intensive. And then the second, this is an obvious one, but investment banking does not equal M&A. And we've spoken about demystifying IBD over the last few months. We've done a blog series on it. There are so many parts of IBD from an advisory perspective, you know, from a capital markets perspective, equity and debt capital markets, from a coverage perspective, sector coverage teams that we spoke about last week. So it's not just the big deals, the M&A. That's not investment bank. That's not the only thing that we do in investment banking, it's a lot more than that. So those are a couple of common misconceptions. Yeah, my, my two quickly would be this idea that you have to have this kind of alpha personality because mm. it's so competitive. You've got to be like fairly sharp and look over your shoulder and all these sorts of things. And yeah, as much as some of that will exist amongst a, a small minority of individuals, I think actually some of the most successful people I've seen from a graduate perspective have been those who are just nice people, super smart, but super collaborative, easy to get on with, um, and good, you know, good personality overall. And so you don't have to be this kind of uh, this generic kind of movie style Wall Street person uh, to have success. And actually, I think as you progress through the ranks, someone who's just looks out for themselves only to the benefit of others, I think can make some headway early on. But I think they get found out then as you start to go up the food chain when then people start to make um, more decisions about you, particularly managing and working with other people. My second one is exactly an extension of your second point, which is don't forget that within an investment bank overall, there's lots of other roles that are non-banking, non-trading. Uh, technology is a massive one where I can't remember how big it is now. Tens of thousands of people at JP Morgan work as technologists. There's then salespeople. There's then people who work in law, accounting, in marketing. You know, there's so many other outlets there for people of different skill sets. It doesn't necessarily just need to be um, the obvious ones. Okay. Well, look, I mean, I I'm going to ask you a question that might run counter to your this is no longer an alpha environment. <laughs> the final question that we've got um, from an anonymous. Did you ever get shouted at and why in an office environment? I'm sure you got shouted at a few times, Anne. Well, yeah, a few, <laughs> more than a few. Well, I think you said this earlier. The you know, We started our careers probably around the same time, so around 2006. And at that period, it was a lot, I would say it was a lot different in terms of the immediacy of feedback that we used to receive from the trading floor as being part of say a research desk. And so there's two, I can remember there's well, there's two, I guess I can remember for different reasons. Um, one was my first week and I didn't know anything at all. Um, Cause I, you know, my story is a bit different where I got drafted in as a helping hand uh, on a desk on uh, the request of my brother. And I was reluctant to do it because I didn't want to work in finance at the time, but I thought, look, he's asked me, I actually took a holiday off my current job at the time 
to go and to go and help him. And then um, <laughs> on, on the desk one morning, and then my brother, it was my brother himself who was teaching me the ropes on a few things. And it was, uh, what time was it? It would have been 7.30, I think, was the short Sterling Open. So this is short end UK rates. And so my job in the morning was from six till seven. He wanted me to read all the news related to the UK. And then he asked me, how is short Sterling front month like going to open up or down? And I said, down. <laughs> and then he, then he absolutely lost his shit basically. <laughs> and uh, he was, he, because it was quite simple though. I just, uh, having not studied any finance or economics, I didn't get the principle of, you know, good news means high yields means bonds goes down so that principle of bonds and yields i'd never even been taught it at that point and little to him because my brother was old school alpha alpha super alpha and he absolutely busted me to the point where i got sent home at 7 45 and told not to come back for the rest of the day <laughs> wow there you go so, so that was uh that was one where it was um pretty brutal but like i said this is all very old school style and being taught and then the one that actually stuck with me more and actually led to a very positive change even though it felt very hard at the time was i remember um the team i was managing was gradually getting bigger and bigger and bigger now the problem that i had was all of the clients because my voice was to speak on a microphone to transmit market news in real time market surveillance to lots of different trading floors. However, what ended up happening was because all of the clients requested my voice on the mic, I found it really hard to step off the mic. So therefore I was doing kind of all the analyst work and doing all the mic time and not really letting them do a great deal. And I remember I had to go to the hospital for an appointment and basically the desk missed something and it was quite catastrophic for our users because they missed an opportunity to to make money and it's very black and white in trading um and then i remember at the time my boss called me up and he absolutely destroyed me <laughs> and i remember thinking <laughs> oh my god like i work so hard like i work so hard i get up at 4 30 in the morning i go to work at six i run this team we're faultless every day and then i step away a wheel falls off and I just get busted and I got really upset about it. But then I actually, once I'd got over that kind of trauma, I actually thought, right, it's not healthy actually for me to take on the responsibility of like 15 people. Of course I can't do it because what's being demanded of us is just com compounding. And that was a trigger point of when then I had to start to learn to delegate for pretty much the first time in my working life and I mean, delegate effectively, where I used to have to like handcuff myself to just not go on that desk near that microphone. And they were bad to start. And I'd have to just swallow it and just watch them. But gradually they got better. And then the manager's dream or the coach's dream, the players outperform whatever I could have done. And they were better than I was. And that was, that was then when I thought, okay, now I've actually learned how to manage people um, and it all came from that was a really hard period because I was about 27, I'd say at the time. So I was not young, but getting to the point of tipping into managing a bigger team, basically. There How you about go. you? No, so, I mean, look, in, in, in IBD, it's less, it's, it's probably a less shouty environment. I remember, get, I remember getting shouted at once, and, and I don't have any of the stories that you do, but I remember getting shouted at once for something something that happened, and it was actually, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that what I did was particularly wrong. It was something to do with the pitch deck, um, but it actually turned out that that director ended up getting fired a few months later. So it's it actually like, you know, that is not the way to behave, and he got called out. You know, a number mm -hmm. of analysts actually made complaints in a bigger organization that's that kind of stuff is not going to stand if it happens a lot and there are much more effective ways of communicating frustration and disappointment everyone is human 
But uh, I think if you do it repeatedly and you don't learn to to manage your temper and things like that, then you will get called up, especially in one of those big organizations with big HR teams and things like that. But no, I was, I, you know, not too many people shouted at me. <laughs> one thing I, yeah, I mean, that fundamentally might be a bit of a difference with the trading floor. And again, this was quite old school. But my final thing to say on to conclude was just this idea about having a thick skin. I was quite, I guess, primed because I played competitive sport at a fairly significant level where it was serious at quite a young age. So I was used to not playing sport for fun. Mm. <laughs> sport was supposed to be played to win at all costs. And so therefore it was run like an army, basically, with the way we would train, the way we do everything. So I'd already kind of had that training. And that actually was somewhat the key to my success in the early part of my career because some of the really uh, intellectually gifted analysts just couldn't take that nature of confrontation that would naturally happen because in trading it's very black and white when a mistake happens or something goes wrong and there are multiple deadlines that exist throughout one single day so it, it's not as long in terms of overall time as say banking but it's very high intensity mm. and you need to get comfortable and and this is one thing I was always comfortable with. And I think the traders actually liked me for that reason. They could bust my balls. I'd take it. I would learn. I would not make a mistake again. And we would all go to the pub afterwards and be mm. mates. Yeah. And it's like, if you can, it's hard to do that. Some people could not do that. They're like, oh my God, that guy, I'm going to like, going to kill him. <laughs> but that's just toxic then. Once that seed is planted and it, and it manifests, it's, it's bad. And that is one of many reasons why I've never set foot on a trading floor. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you, Stephen. And, and thank you to everyone for sharing their questions. If you have any more questions and you're listening to this, there is the option on Spotify, I know, to leave a comment. So please do. We do see them. I promise. And if we see enough of recurring questions, we will definitely, definitely incorporate it into some future episodes so hopefully this mini series of two episodes was useful i wish everyone the best have a fantastic summer uh, it sounds like we're going away we're not we'll be back as normal next week so see you then thanks Adam.